At this point, we turn to some animals. And it is known that in animals that there are a variety of toxins that one can feed to an animal that the animal will selectively demyelinate specific parts of the nervous system. So this is a central nervous system of a mouse, and this actually is what we call the corpus callosum. The staining for myelin here is in blue. So you see the blue area here, and this is an animal that's been fed this substance, and that you can see that the blue area has disappeared. And if one looks under a microscope, you can see that the myelin has been destroyed. Now, if you look at that, if you stop feeding the animal this toxin, the cuprazone, and you look at that animal three weeks later, the myelin has all come back. Well, if it's come back, something has to be making the myelin. And the observations from the experimental biologists are that this recovery is being made by cells that are not the original cells that made the myelin, and if you want another long word, it's oligodendrocyte. So it's not the mature oligodendrocyte that made the new myelin, at least in a mouse, but it's cells that were immature cells that responded to some kind of signal, turned on their program, and made new myelin. Those cells are referred to as progenitor cells, and I'm going to get to in a minute how, what we use the word, how we use the word progenitor cell and stem cell, and for most purposes, we tend to use them interchangeably. So the experimentalists tell us that remyelination, at least in animals, is coming from progenitor cells. So if we have remyelination in MS, like I showed you, and the biologists tell us that remyelination is coming from progenitor cells, one might conclude that there must be progenitor cells in the adult human brain. So now we've got to find them. Okay, so this is just a flow diagram. So we all start out here from an egg, a fertilized egg, and the very first cells that, as the, uh, in development, are cells that are called pluripotential stem cells. What does that mean? Those very early cells have the capacity to turn into any cell in the body. And you could have deduced that from, since we all start from a one cell organ, one cell and then two cells and four cells, those cells must give rise to the heart and the lungs and the bones, etc. So these are the so-called pluripotential stem cells. They can give rise to stem, other stem cells that make non-nervous system cells, bone marrow cells, and other cells outside called mesenchymal stem cells. And then they also can give rise to cells inside the nervous system that, are, that at this point, these are further along and largely they can only make cells of the nervous system. They can no longer make cells of, the re of heart cells or skin cells. And we refer to those as neural stem cells. Some people would start to call these progenitor cells. And as we go along this pathway, we, these cells become more specialized. And so some of them can only start, they reach a point where they are pro, their program would mainly make them able to make myelin cells others can make the neurons or nerve cells. So this is the flow pathway, and what has happened in the research field that people have looked, found markers, if you will, uh, signatures of these cells that allow us to identify it. And these are some of the markers. We don't have to go into specifically what they mean. But this one, which I'll point out, called A2B5, is a marker it's expressed on the cells of progenitor neural progenitor cells. And the reason I'm pointing this out is this is the marker that's been most used in, when people have searched for human progenitor cells. The other has been this marker here. Okay, so I've tried to tell you that we now have ways of identifying stem cells and we think that they are progenitor cells and they must exist in the human brain. Now, before I go on to tell you about our search for those cells and how, what strategies we can use uh, to make them more effective or replace them, I want to touch a little bit of sideline. I mentioned other cells, other stem cells that make non-nervous system cells. 
And one hears a lot about bone marrow stem cell transplants in the context of MS. And here I've put a, uh, there's a program directed by my colleague Mark Friedman and Harry Atkins in Ottawa, the Canadian Bone Marrow Transplant Study Group. And this is used as a treatment for, as a research treatment for pe people with MS who have very aggressive relapsing MS. The treatment that is actually being given is high dose chemotherapy, which wipes out the immune system. That's the treatment. Where do the stem cells fit in? The bone marrow stem cells fit in. Those are used to replace the immune system. And the hope is that we have uh, eliminated the immune system. And if you remember what Peter Rickman showed about those autoreactive stem cell, uh, autoreactive immune cells that are causing the damage, hopefully we've wiped out those cells. Unfortunately, we've wiped out everything else. And then by replacing the immune system with these new stem cells, which build a new immune system, the hope is that these will no longer have the disease-producing cells. But the treatment in this situation is the chemotherapy. The stem cells are the rescue. Now, so now we have to go think about stem cell therapy. And this drawing was done this week by my postdoctoral fellow, Peter Darlington, who is an artist. And I said, Peter, we have to think about rebuilding the brain or fixing the brain. And this is his view of how the construction workers are going to have to figure out how to put this back together again. And as we and the field have thought about how are we going to go after the repair mechanisms, we have divided it into two large groups. One is that will we have to provide the stem cells from outside? Will we have to in grow stem cells and inject them into people, into the lesions presumably, or in some way, namely so that are we going to have to supply an external source of these cells if there are not enough cells there to do the job? The other is if there are cells, these stem cells or progenitor cells present in the brain, then perhaps we can find ways to increase their activity and therefore let the cells that are there do the job. So if we're going to talk about giving cells from outside, the exogenous repair st strategies, which cells would you give somebody if you wanted to repair the person's brain? Well, you could give these neural stem cells, so these cells know that they're supposed to be cells that build nerve cells. But where would you get them from? And the dilemma is, would you try and get them out of the person? Would you do a brain operation to get those cells? It doesn't seem very practical for the moment. Would you get it from a, 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 another donor and give it, well, once you're going from one donor to the other, you face the dilemma of having rejection, just like you would with a kidney graft or a heart graft, and have to use immune suppression. Now, maybe we could take it from the peripheral nervous system or from a peripheral source, and if these cells still have the potential to develop into additional cell types, maybe we could take it from an easy source. We could take it from the peripheral nerve, the so-called Schwann cells, or we could take it from the skin, which also has cells that can become neural cells. I think the dilemma here at the moment is that we don't have the robust techniques to make these cells truly become mature central nervous system cells. So it's still an active field of research. When Schwann cells, actual peripheral nerve cells were implanted into MS patients, initial results were not very favorable. So this is the, still a possibility of where to get the cells from. Now, very easy to get are cells from the bone marrow here, and that these cells, either bone marrow cells and a related cell from within the marrow called the mesenchymal cells, these cells can be grown readily. And in fact, those clinical trials have already started. And I'll mention that again as we go a little later in the talk. But what seems to happen with those cells, initially there was great enthusiasm that if you took those cells from the bone marrow, those stem cells, and injected it intravenously, so that's practical. So now we've met a way of getting the cells, 
and a way of injecting, that it turns out that those cells really don't turn themselves into nerve cells.